Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 2,226. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah. Today, I'm in Toledo, Ohio, with a very special guest by the name of Ken Rusk. Ken, welcome to Cars Yeah. Do you have it in gear, and are you ready to release the clutch? Absolutely, Mark. Let's do it. We'll have some fun. Now, before I introduce you and we dive into what you do, and specifically a very cool book that relates a lot to a lot of my listeners and a lot of my guests, I want you to share one little thing that most people may not know about Ken Rusk. Uh, one thing that they may not know. Well, I, I probably, uh, I have an addiction to new golf shirts. So <laughs> every time I go to a golf course, <laughs> I have to buy a golf shirt. But, um, the good news is my son-in-law is my exact same size. So now he has a lot of golf shirts too. <laughs> <laughs> Lucky him. Yeah. He scored. That's a good deal. Yeah, I've got this, I've got the same thing with hats from automotive events, but I'm follically challenged. So I try to always wear a hat anyway, but my wife looks in the closet and goes, why do you have so many hats? It's ridiculous. So, yeah, well, that's the way it is. So let me give you a proper introduction. Ken Rusk is a best-selling author, entrepreneur, and blue-collar advocate showing that there's no degree required for comfort, peace, and freedom in your life. Ken spent his younger years digging ditches and working in construction. He never went to college, but instead he made goals, plans, and hard work work for him over 30 plus years. Ken is a very successful entrepreneur with multiple business and revenue streams. He specializes in mentoring and has coached hundreds of young people in areas uh, as uh, midterm, short-term, and life-setting goals. He's passionate about helping people achieve their dreams, regardless of their education, background, or past. And the book we're going to talk about today is called Blue Collar Cash, Love Your Work, Secure Your Future, and Find Happiness for Life. And he's going to share his beliefs and his experiences. And guess what? Ken's an automotive enthusiast too, as well. And I learned this morning he Likes Porsche 911s, and you listeners know that's my mark of choice. We'll be back in just a moment, but first a word from our sponsors. So please give them a little love. They keep the fuel in the tanks here, and we'll be right back. Our pets are a big part of our family, and we love to take them everywhere we go. But they can be very hard on your vehicle's interiors. If you add the fall and winter weather, you'll end up with water, mud, snow, and a whole lot more that Fido tracks into your cars. Covercraft offers a wide variety of solutions to protect your vehicle's interior from fall and winter's rough treatment and Fido's too. Canine cargo area covers are padded for your pet's comfort and provide door-to-door protection. Pet pads have built-in features to keep cargo areas and seats well protected, and they're easy to clean. Covercraft's quality pet solutions cover cargo areas, bucket or bench seats, and protects from the damaging claws, pet fur, hair, mud, moisture, drool from permanently damaging your vehicles. Choose from a variety of styles and covers for almost every vehicle made. And here's a special deal for you Cars Yeah listeners. If you use the code YAH21 at Covercraft.com, you'll get 10% off your Covercraft order. What a deal. Covercraft, protecting the things that move you and making life a lot easier with the pets we love so much. Covercraft. American Collectors Insurance is my go-to for classic car insurance needs. But did you know they also insure your valuable collections of automobilia and other collectibles? If you're like me, you've invested in a lot of cool collectibles over the years. Those items are valuable. And if you were to lose them in a theft or a fire, well, try to get your normal homeowner's insurance to pay you what they're worth. Good luck with that. American Collectors Insurance provides you with assurance and confidence that your collectibles are fully covered. They insure a lot of items, including automobilia, wine, baseball cards, books, figurines, die-cast models, model trains, glassware, sports memorabilia, toys, and a whole lot more. American Collectors Insurance, they've been protecting us enthusiasts since 1976. They provide you with an agreed value insurance policy backed by a long history of taking care of their clients. Give them a call today for your personal agreed value quote at 866-ACA. Yeah, yeah. That's 866-224-9324. Tell them you're a friend of mine. Mark Green's here at Cars Yeah. American Collectors Insurance. Classic car insurance designed by collectors for collectors. Automotive enthusiasts just like you and me. 
That's American Collectors Insurance. You've heard me talk about Linkage Magazine here on Cars, yeah, for a couple of years now. Well, they're growing. And in 2023, they're going to grow from four issues a year to six. And there's an opportunity here for you to take advantage of this growth. If you go to LinkageMag.com and click on the Renew button, if you already subscribe, you can get a great deal. Use the code RENEW6 for one year and you'll get six issues for the price of four or Type in Renew 12 for two years where you also have a great savings. Plus, they'll even throw in a free Linkage hat. How cool is that? The publisher of Linkage is Donald Osborne. He's been a guest multiple times here on Cars Yeah. He's become a good friend of mine. And I'll tell you, Linkage Magazine is one of those newer magazines that you're going to want to get. It's all about experiences, opinions, and values. It's a wonderful publication, something I look forward to getting. And now that I'm going to be getting six a year, (laughs) even more special. So go to LinkageMag.com. Again, use the code RENEW6 or RENEW12 to get that special deal. Do it before December 31st, 2022, so that in 2023, you'll get six issues of Linkage Magazine instead of four. So, Ken, what I'd love for you to do is is first share a little bit about your background for our listeners. It could include some car talk, and we're going to be talking more in depth about your personal passion for car later in our talk. Bring us through your career and what brought you to where you are now, because this is a very interesting trip. Well, you know, when I was 15, my high school shared a fence with an industrial park. And, uh, you know, my buddies and I, after school, we would cut through a hole in that fence that had been very well worn out over the years. And we would cut through that industrial park on our way to the carry out where we hung out after school and and just, you know, did what young guys did. So I loved cars and I I wanted to buy my first car and uh, I needed a job. I needed some money for that. So one day I, I I knew somebody that had worked at one of these construction companies and I stopped and said, what do you guys do? And they said, well, you know, we're basically ditch diggers. And I said, well, I, I can do that. I need money like anything else buy my first car, take my girlfriend out for pizza, maybe go bowling with my buddies, whatever it was. So I started working in the uh, summertime digging ditches for this company. And then in the wintertime, I would work in the office because I was still in high school. It just kind of grew into, I kind of learned what the front of the house looked like and what the back of the house looked like as far as how they ran things. And when I was about 18 or 19, I had the choice of either going to school or traveling around the country, opening up uh, branch offices of of this company. And um, I chose that. It was nice because I could open a company from scratch at 18 years of age with somebody else's money and somebody else's risk. And uh, it it generally worked out. Yeah, it it worked out great. Those companies are still around today. And after three or four years of that, I got tired of living out of a suitcase. So I um, set up shop in Toledo, Ohio. And we started with six employees, and I think we have nearly 200 now, so it's been uh, it's been a heck of a ride. Oh, my goodness. You know, this is really fun because a lot of my listeners and my guests are hands-on type people, what, what we would call blue-collar, although nowadays I, I like to refer to it as new-collar careers because people that work on cars, let's say fabricators, restoration shops, painters, artists, mechanics, detailers, even manufacturers of parts used to be looked at as this blue collar career, maybe looked down upon a little bit versus white collar, if you will. But things have changed a lot. And one of the things I love about your book is you really try to help people realize that it isn't so much what you do, it's how you feel about what you do. Is that what your book's all about? Yeah. So, you know, I look at it this way. So there's 165 million people in the U.S. considered fully employed. OK, about 77 million of those people do something with their hands, like you just mentioned. The problem that I have with it is, is colleges are influencing high schools and high schools are influencing parents to tell their kids that if they don't go to college, they'll never amount to anything. And that has never been true in the history of our company. It's certainly not true today. And as you just mentioned, you know, the, the blue collar jobs today are highly technically advanced. Um, so anyone can do them. Men, men or women can do a lot of these jobs. And, uh, and, and because all of these kids are kind of flowing towards college, you know, aimlessly, you have this huge hole opening up on the other side in, 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 in the blue collar fields. And, and as you know, supply and demand is simple. We learned it in Economics 101, where supply is low and demand is high. That's where the money goes. So that's what we're seeing right now. And um, 
all of my most successful friends are, are blue collar guys. I mean, <laughs> and blue collar gals. And it's great to see that. It's great to buck the system. That's why I say, you know, if you know what you want your life to look like, Mark, sometimes I think it doesn't matter what you do for a living as much as it does what you do with what you do for a living, which is how you live your life and um, and the goal setting that comes along with it. And that's been the genesis for all of my cars and all the other things I've tried to accomplish in my life. And it continues to work pretty well for me. You know, when I started my podcast eight and a half years ago, it was on the premise of my mantra, which is inspiring automotive enthusiasts. And I wanted to speak to inspirational people like yourself and the, the over 2000 I've interviewed now so that together we could inspire people to realize that there is an opportunity to have fun in an area that you love. And it all started, the genesis was a good friend of mine who's a brain surgeon. He's a pediatric neurosurgeon. And he used to come and hang out with me on Thursday night, boys night out, a business I was in. We'd invite all these people over and I'd have them test products that we were developing. And one night he said to me, I wish I could do what you do for a living. And I said, Bill, you save people's lives. You operate on babies' brains. I mean, my gosh. And he goes, yeah, but I'm kind of just a mechanic. We crack skulls. I go in, I fix it, and we button them up. And I, you know, I said, well, you're, you're kind of oversimplifying your career. But the point was he was living for the day he could retire and go play with cars because that's what he really liked. Now, on the flip side, I said, what does this taught you working on so many people's brains and cervical spines and so forth? And he said, Life can be very short and a lot shorter than you think. So you better be doing what you love. That's what your book has figured out. So I'd love for you to share a couple thoughts from your book because I want people to buy it and read it about how does somebody figure that out? If they get all this stuff about college out of the way and if that's not the right thing for them, how do they secure a good future? How do they find what they want to do and love what they want to do? Yeah, first off, I think this is something that most of us don't do. I think a lot of us live these if then lives. You know, if I go to high school, if I get good grades, if I get a college scholarship, and then if I get a degree, and then if I graduate with the degree that I wanted, and then if I get a a job, and if that job pays well, then I can start living my life. Well, that's absolutely backwards. I mean, when you back your your 911 out of the driveway and you put it in first you don't wonder where the heck are you going. I mean, you always have a plan to go somewhere. Your car is going to go to church or to school or to work or whatever it might be. And I think that's the way we should live our lives. So I advocate big time for sitting down in a quiet place. We do it in a, in a rather young way. We, we, we give people poster boards and crayons and we say, <laughs> draw your life. I mean, yeah. if, if you could draw your life exactly the way you see it, exactly the way you want it, okay? Draw that out and then let that kind of be your vision board and let that drag you along because what we can see very clearly, we always attract ourselves to. Our brains are so much more powerful than we give them credit for. And, um, uh, you know, I can tell you a story about a, a seven-year brochure that, that I got involved with with my very first uh, 9-11. Yeah, and, um, share it. Yeah, you know, this was something where I saw these cars. I loved these cars. I wanted one of these cars. And I thought, how the heck am I ever going to do it? So what I did was I had a seven-year agreement with one of my partners to buy the company out from them. Mm. And um, I said to myself, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to have this 9-11 in seven years to the day from right now. So I went to the Porsche dealership and I got a brochure and I said, I'm coming back in seven years to buy this car. And they all laughed at me. So then, then year two, I went and I got another brochure. And then year three, I went and I got another brochure. And I stuck those brochures in my nightstand and I looked at them. Yep. And um, by year four, they looked at me and they said, you know, we're starting to believe you're serious here. <laughs> yeah. And um, year five and year six, two more brochures. And halfway through that year, I walked in with my pen and I said, let's order it right now. And they laughed. They celebrated. They could not believe it. How fun. But I can tell you, I knew for a fact that I was going to have that car in seven years. And, and I knew it because I kept it in front of me. So I don't care what it is. If you have something clearly in front of you, you will always attract yourself to it. And, and I think that's the secret of the book, which is you're so much more in control of your life than you think you are. As long as you have a reason why, as long as there's, there's a reason, there's something you're chasing, something you're anticipating, something you can't wait for. And, um, you know, take your goals and change them from if goals to when goals. It's just a matter of time. And I think that's the biggest part of the book that people get the most out of. 
You know, I love a lot of things. You dropped a lot of golden nuggets there. I, I guess I was doing that before I even uh, knew you existed, Ken, because when I started my career out of college, I was working in an ad agency and I had a big poster in front of my desk that was a red portion of 911. And every day I'd sit and look at that thing and go, okay, how am I going to get, how am I going to get that? And eventually I yeah. move up into the parking lot in it, but it was right there in front of me. So the vision board concept is brilliant. And I love the other parts of don't live an if then life figure out the why. Simon Sinek, which I'm sure you know of, does a great thing with a TED Talk and a book about finding our why. What are some tips that you give young or old people that are doing a career transition on how to figure out that why? Because I'm surprised by how many people I talk to and I say, well, why do you want to do that? And they don't have an answer. Well, and, and that's the thing. If you can't answer why, then you don't want that thing, whatever it is. <laughs> it's that simple. I don't care whether you want to learn another language or you want to take a photography class or you want to lose weight or you want to, whatever it is, you want to, you want to buy something. If you don't have a clear why, then you really don't want that. So the first thing I tell people is, you know, we're not get, we're not all going to go after, you know, mega yachts and, you know, of 15 cars and mansions and jet planes and all that. I mean, if that's what you want, fine, go for it. Mm. But seek what your nirvana is. If you could say, man, I call it comfort, peace, and freedom in the book, Mark. If, if, if I could find this triangle of comfort, peace, and freedom, if I could obtain that nirvana, that would really be cool. And it takes a little bit of soul searching, but you and only you know what you're good at. You and only you know what would make you happy. You and only you know what type of things you'd like to drive, live in, charities to give to, sports to be involved in. So take the power of the visual side of your brain, which most of us never use, and put that to work for it. And, and I'll tell you why I say that, because we are all really good at visualizing vacations, okay? <laughs> I'm going to go to Florida and six months and I'm going to take my sandals and my beach chair and my umbrella and I'm going to order this drink and I'm going to listen to this music and I'm going to feel that sun on my face and the salt sea air breeze on my body and you know I'm going to get a suntan and I'm going to, you know I'm going to do all these cool things okay we anticipate that for months two three four five six months and then that day comes and we realize it so if we're good at doing that over something as silly and simple as a vacation, why aren't we using the same type of anticipatory power that our brain has to look at all aspects of our life? Because if you're not chasing something or anticipating something, life can be pretty stale. I just think that's the only way to live. I love it. Now, I would think your book not only works for somebody that's just starting out in life, but maybe somebody a little older or somebody trans transitioning into what this word retirement might mean. And I've had a lot of talks with friends of late because I'm of that age of people talking about retirement. And one of the things that I ask a lot of my friends, and many of them are people that have a lot of money, a lot of assets, they, they've made the dream and they've had this incredible career. And I say, what are you going to do when you retire and you're not working 12, 13 hours a day, six days a week? And I'm always surprised how many people don't have an answer other than, well, I'm going to go travel or take the day off or, you know, what? I mean, some, some little thing, but no, what specific, like, what does every day look like? Could your book be of help to somebody transitioning into that point in their life? Or let's say they're 50 and they want to make a change. They're not happy with their career. I, I can tell you that I, I think every one of us, if we really sat down and thought about it, we would probably be good at a half a dozen different things. I, I really, I really believe that. I love to build things. I love to fix things. I love to remodel things. I love to get things new. I, I, I love to do all these different things. And so I just think we have to give ourselves a little more credit. You know, I've had so many people say, my gosh, Ken, I read your book in you know, when I was 19, I paid my way through college by being a plumber's helper. And I love the fact that the boss could control his own input. He could control his own output. He could control his own schedule, his day. Mm -hmm. He could control the quality of work. He could control who he wanted to work for. And he could also control his financial gain, which was plenty. And um, I, 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 you know, I, I, I loved the independence of that, but I was following this blind path to college. And here I am sitting in this cubicle on the 15th floor working for a medical company, and I hate it. So he told me, he said, I actually... I quit my job and I went back to being a plumber and he goes, 
I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled. I've never been happier. And, and I owe it all to your book because you just, you kind of slapped me in the face here by saying, be happy first. I mean, think about what you want your life to look like first and then figure out how to get there. So I think if anyone just is honest with themselves and sits down and is like, like the, your, your surgeon friend. Okay. First off, I applaud that. I, I think it's, I think it's amazing. We have people like that on this planet, <laughs> no but I would bet, I uh, bet you that if he sat down, he would figure out that, man, I might like to have a, I might like to have a, a cigar bar, or I might like to have, um, you know, a, a, a carpentry shop, or I might like to do what we're doing. I, ha- I have a big barn with a bunch of woodworking tools, and I have my friends come over once a month, and we, we build something, and we, we drink bourbon, and, you know, we listen to music, and yeah. we build something. And give yourself the credit to know that there's something out there that you would enjoy doing, and then just go for it. Most definitely. Uh, it's important. My father, when he was so-called retired, went over to his house, and my listeners know this story, but I love sharing it. And you'll like it too, Ken. Uh, he had, his TVs were out by the curb with the trash. And I said, all your TVs broke at the same time? And he said, you know, my friends retire. They sit around and they look at those death boxes and they die. I'm getting rid of my TV. <laughs> uh, and he got more busy and he was a busy guy. He had his own business. He got more busy in retirement. And he was when he was running his architectural firm. And I applauded him for that because uh, he figured out the secret sauce to, to happiness and to life. Uh, I think it's absolutely brilliant and it's so important for us to do. We'll take a short break and thank our sponsors. We come back. Let's talk a little bit and carry this extension a little bit further before we dive into your passion for cars uh, with what I call the challenge question. So buckle up, get ready for that, and we'll be right back. You listeners know that I'm a huge car care fanatic, and my friends at AutoGeek created their Wolfgang Deep Gloss Paint Sealant for perfectionists like you and me. Wolfgang a Deep Gloss Paint Sealant is designed to provide long-lasting protection and a glossy, slick finish that, well, it's unmatched. The use of polymer technology ensures your paint is protected from environmental contaminants, those damaging UV rays, and lasts up to three months long. By providing the glossy look of Carnuba Wax with the longevity of a synthetic formula, Wolfgang a Deep Gloss Paint Sealant is the best of both worlds. Go to autogeek.net to get yours for the best product selection on the internet today, along with their skilled technical support. Autogeek.net is where I go for all my detailing needs. That's autogeek.net. TechForce is a charity of choice here at Cars Yeah. Auto techs are in high demand, but the supply... It's critically short. For every one tech who graduates school, there's five jobs waiting for them. Said another way, four technician jobs go unfilled for every technician graduate. Lots of young people love cars, but don't know how to turn that passion into their careers. TechForce Foundation shows them through career exploration, technical education, and the workforce development solutions. Join Cars Yeah! in supporting TechForce Foundation and its mission to solve the technician shortage by donating at techforce.org today. So Ken, I always ask my guests about uh, the challenge question, and typically I tie it to a big challenge or failure that they came across in their life. But more importantly, it was an incredible learning opportunity. And they look back now and go, well, I'm kind of glad I went through that. Is there something like that that happened with you that has brought you to where you are today? You know, I, I write a chapter in the book about the, what I call the death clock, and it was the clock that <laughs> it was the clock F bought me for Christmas unknowingly. Um, and, and this clock was one of those clocks that ran backwards. You would enter your oh current gosh. age, wow, and you would enter your you know the life expectancy, which at the time was seventy eight point three years or whatever, and then you'd hit start, and this thing would start running backwards, and it would tell you how much life you have left. Oh, that's by the frightening. Minute. <laughs> that's scary. That's scary as hell. <laughs> well, I, I got to tell you, in the beginning, you know, you turn into this really like efficient person. OK, I'm not going to talk to that guy or that gal because they waste my time. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. So in, in the first week or so, you get really in touch with how life goes. And, and you know, you, you leave the office on Friday, you come back and 72 hours are gone. You know what I mean? So yep. yeah. it's um, it, it's really something. But one of the things that I learned was I learned that. I can't be everything. And and the more I try to be everything to my company, the, the more stagnant it becomes. So I, I a long time ago, I came up with this line. I said, listen, I can't get what I want, nor can my company get what it wants or needs until all of you get what you want first. And, and I absolutely believe that. I've, I've, I've said that a hundred times over the past 30 years, because if you empower people to become entrepreneurial employees, meaning 
they they run their own departments. They you know they run their budgets. They run their 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 the results. They run you know who to hire, where to hire, where to put them. If you can get a team around you like that, and then you say, look at our company is doing X amount of dollars right now. If we get to X plus X Y or X Z, I will share a substantial part of that with all of you. You you, you will. You will have these these folks around you say, "Okay, Ken, great, thanks, man. Now get out of our way and let us go do it." So, <laughs> yeah, your company will go so much further with that type of driving force behind it than you can ever do it yourself. So, you know, let go of the word boss, let go of the of the ego, let go of the pounding your chest and saying, "Man, I fixed this today and I solved that today, and look at me go." You, you got to almost become irrelevant to your company. I know that's scary for some people to think, but the more irrelevant you, you become to your company, the more that your company will fly. Ah, uh, you know, yes. I mean, that's how people like Roger Penske build empires like they have, right? Uh, Absolutely. Or Elon Musk or I mean, name anybody, I mean, who's just done a stellar job of building empires. And, and for a person that goes to work and clocks time, looks at those people and say, how can they have five businesses? There's not enough hours in the day. Well, they have the same hours as you and I have, right? But they do exactly what you just said. Yeah, you know, I, I, think, I think the difference is get to the place where you do what you like and, and, and don't do what you don't like and, or, or what you're <laughs> yeah. not good at. So. You know that 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 oh, oh that that test quadrant has been around for years, where you put your put your things in there and figure out where you should be. But there's no doubt that Elon Musk sits around and uses the visual side of his brain much more than the rest of us do. But he's probably not pounding out, you know, certain type of mechanical things every day, so he can allow himself that space to think. And um, I just think that's where we need to live. We need to live in where we're most effective. And 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 if, if you can if you can tear the roof off your company, for example, and hover above it in a helicopter and look down on it and say, okay, I can see now what's going on from a you know from a an altitude or a holistic point of view. You're going to be way better at running the company because you're allowing the people within it to not only help you run it but to reap the benefits of of doing a great job. And I think that's the biggest lesson I've ever learned in my whole career. Challenge your employees to be entrepreneurial, entre, entrepreneurial employees. I love it. It's a, it's a brilliant idea. Again, you listeners, Blue Collar Cash is the title of this book. Love your work, secure your future, and find happiness for life. Uh, indeed. So let's talk cars, Ken, because I've learned something about you today. You like Porsche 911s. Uh, my listeners at nauseum hear me talk about them. I love those cars. I'd love for you to share a special vehicle story. It might be that one that you visualize or maybe another one in your life, but tell us about a car that really stands out for you and maybe take us on a, a little journey. Well, I've, I've got a small stable going. I'm not, I'm not a huge collector. I'm certainly no Jay Leno when it comes to stuff like that. <laughs> That's a lot of cars to um, manage. Jay's, Jay's got there. Yeah. You know, it, it's funny how cars are different. So my my first one was a a 911 C4S. It was the four wheel drive one, and it was it was a it was a, a great car. I loved it. It was a hard top, and um, it was a little heavy. You know what I mean? It was a great car, but it just felt a little heavy. So then I went and I got a 911 convertible C2S, which I still have. It's it's gosh, it's almost 20 years old, and it's got like 10,000 or 11,000 miles on it. But so then I started going into muscle cars, and you know the, the funny thing is. I have a, a GT500 Super Snake that um, has 850 horsepower and Yikes. supercharged and <laughs> wow. all this kind of stuff. So people ask me because I've collected a couple. I've got a I've got a, a uh, backdraft Cobra replica, which is just incredible. It's nothing but just engine and, and fiberglass. And um, people ask me the difference in the cars, and I say, well, I say driving that 911 is like playing a Stradivarius violin, right? It's <laughs> yeah. smooth. It's perfect and driving this uh this gt500 is like you know jumping on a horse for the very first time and the horse doesn't like you very much so <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's uh, yeah it's it's unbelievable how different these cars are and but they're both so much fun in their own individual way i have a doctorate in car psychology and well it's kind of made up but i've got a mac i, I can make up all sorts of cool stuff and <laughs> i'm gonna crawl into your head a little bit here ken if you were reincarnated pun intended as a vehicle this isn't what you want to be though this is how you perceive your personality in some kind of a car and since you have kind of a variety of vehicles this might be easy for you what kind of vehicle w would you be but more importantly why 
I think I would be that Porsche GT, you know, the one with the rear engine. Oh. <laughs> the, <laughs> yeah, I know the GT. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I'd be one of those only because there, there's sure as heck not a lot of them out there. They're, they're absolutely so unbelievably unique. They're definitely a, a showstopper when you walk by one of those. And um, it, it's funny because... You know, you kind of know what a Ferrari is and you know what a Lamborghini is and you know what a, even a 911, you know what those are. People are familiar with them. But when they see one of those GTs, they look at it and they're like, what in God's name is that? And, um, you know, I, I just think they are they're mysterious to people. They're, they're um, ridiculously performative. And uh, so, yeah, that would be one of those uh, one of those GTs that you just don't see every day. Yeah. Pretty rare car. Have you ever been able to drive one? You know, I haven't. I, I, a friend of mine owns a car dealership down the, down the street, and um, he bought one of the very first ones that that came um, out oh, wow. of, yeah. of the. Yeah, they came out, and um, and he was scared to death of it, and and uh, <laughs> you know, in fact, in fact, one of his clients took his car, it, b- bought another one, and uh, he, within within six hours, he had you know wrapped it around a pole. So, oh, I mean, <laughs> ouch! Yeah. He, you got to be very careful with what you do, but um, you got to respect it at the same time, I guess. I've never been able to drive one. I got a ride in one once, and the owner was talking about the ceramic clutch and, and how it was a little difficult to get to get down pat at first, but once you figure it out. But yeah, it's a car to be respected. Uh, lots and lots of power in that thing. And they certainly have become quite valuable as collector pieces. They kind of stagnated for a while when they first came out. They didn't they just kind of hung out, but they were <laughs> quite expensive uh, at the, in the day. But now they're really pricey, but they're, they're beautiful cars. A yeah. lot of uh, technology went into that car that came out later in the Mini 911. You know, one of the things I've learned interviewing so many people is that we are at our best and we're our happiest when we're giving back. You offer mentorship, blog, uh, you give back, well, through your book to a lot of people. Can you chat a little bit about what you've learned about the importance of giving back to others and helping other people? Well, you know, it's interesting because I've been working with places like, you know, Make-A-Wish and and, uh, uh, Junior Achievement and Boys and Girls Clubs and all that kind of stuff for years and years and years, okay? And um, I I just have to tell tell the people out there that are listening right now, you know, you should never do charity because you think you're going to get something out of it. You know what I mean? You should never. Sometimes when I go to these auctions or these, um, these silent auctions where, you know, you, you pay some money to give a child a wish and you, you somehow you bid on a trip and you get the trip in return. And I, I never really agreed with that. I mean, it's OK if you if you do it. But for me, it's all about giving of yourself, giving of your time, your your, your time and your treasure and your talents. And um, I always involve my staff in a really big way so that they can appreciate and understand how to how these things can make you feel. But I will say this. I will say that even though we've never done it because we wanted to get something out of it, it just seems that the more you bless others, the more blessings come your way. And, and I can't put my finger on it. I can't point to a specific um, scenario there. But the more you give, the more you seem to receive. And I think that the reason that is, is because karma tells people that if they give them more, they'll probably give more again. <laughs> yeah. So that's why in the book, the, the chapter is called Give, Get and Give Again. I think it's very important and it's incumbent upon all of us to share of, of our talents and time and treasure um, to uh, to help people shorten their learning curve that are coming up behind us and, um, you know, to help people out of a bad situation. So um, that's kind of how we do it. Absolutely. I love it. Great chapter, too. So I'm going to enable you to go on what I call the ultimate drive. I'm going to buy you any car in the world. What a dream, huh? Park it in your garage and you can take it on a drive with anybody in the world. Now, this includes somebody from the past, somebody who's no longer with us. Oh, boy, that opens up all sorts of unique learning and fun opportunities. So what does the ultimate drive look like for you, Ken? I would probably want to um, hang out with Max Verstappen <laughs> and drive a uh, <laughs> Boy, he's, car around. He's been controversial lately. <laughs> Always, actually. Yeah. Or or even, what's the gentleman from Mercedes? He's the other one. Just an the amazing driver who go head to head all the time. I think I would I would probably want to have an F1 and, and, and learn how to drive that. You know, maybe not at 220 miles an hour, but something something close to that. So, Ooh. yeah, I, I, I think... Uh, you know, I was in Vegas over the last week, and um, they're going to have the F1 there next year. And I, I was up high in the hotel, and I could kind of see some of the track that they were going to use. And I thought, man, how much fun would it be to to jump in one of those things and, and cruise around? <laughs> if, if, it, if it wasn't something like that, it would have to be, you know, maybe going through the Black Forest of Germany or, um, 
or, uh, you know, some coastal ride somewhere. So, yeah, I think that would be a lot of fun. I think you're referring to Lewis Hamilton, the Mercedes F1 driver. Yeah. 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 Those guys go yeah. at it. Yeah. Max is, he's uh, interesting. I, I had an author of a book about Max on my show this year. His name is Andre Hukaboom, and the book is titled Max the Dutch Master, an unauthorized biography. Fascinating book about that guy. And uh, he went very deep into who this guy is, and it kind of takes you into his mindset. Uh, you know, these F1 drivers, very aggressive athletes. I mean, they have to be. They're competing at the top of the top. But, uh, you know, when I was at the Ferrari factory in 2011, they have a cliente program. And back in a room where they had all these old Formula One Ferraris lined up, they had two three-seater Formula One Ferrari cars, which I never knew. Wow existed and i asked one of the mechanics i go what is that it was a driver in the middle and two seats on the sides kind of like a mclaren f1 car where this and he said oh he smiled those are for uh special guests that come and we used to we don't use them anymore but we used to take people on rides in those out on the track so and i know mario andretti takes people on rides in a two-seater indy car but it's front and rear so you're sitting behind him which would be kind of weird because all you see is yeah. the back of his head but imagine sitting you know, maybe what we do here for you is we put you in the driver's seat and you take Max and Lewis for a ride and then they all swap seats and <laughs> and, and there you go. each of them sees who can scare you more. I don't know if they, they probably wouldn't be allowed by their, their uh, teams to drive an, a Ferrari F1 car, but uh, I think it sounds like fun since we're playing fantasy games here. So yeah, that would be pretty cool. Yeah, there's a, um, there's a documentary that um, I think it's called Drive to Survive or oh, something like that. It's, where it's awesome, it, yeah. It's, I would encourage anyone to watch it. It's it's really incredible, and it kind of puts you in the in the seat of what they go through. And um, I just I think it's great to see that um, that whole because th that's a life that r r you rarely get close to because it's a it's a pretty high end scenario. But um, to watch that on TV, you kind of live that life. It's it's really cool to uh, to experience that. That documentary has done more for Formula One, especially here in the United States, than anything. And they are now going to be producing more of those in different fields of sports because it has opened up the world of sports to people that were never interested in anymore. And I know why, because typically you're just looking at this object with a person in it going around and you don't get to see the backstory because they're so sheltered. And that takes you deep inside people's lives. It's like a reality. Well, it is a reality show, really. And, and, you know, the other thing that's good about that is it shows you the abject failures that happen on a constant basis. I mean, it's not like it's all oh, behind yeah. the sky who went you know, breaking champagne bottles open and all that. They they show you the struggles that these people have and the teams have and the drivers have and the yeah. cars have. And um, so, yeah, I, I think it's cool because you, you get, I mean, these guys are athletes big time. I mean, their, their, their facial, their, their visual reactions have to be faster than someone throwing a hundred mile an hour fastball at them. And, um, and it, it's, it's really crazy to see the whole world behind what happens in what? I mean, they only have what about 13, 10, 10, 12, 13 races a year. That's it. Right. And, um, and so, yeah, it, it's really cool to see the cities and, and the cultures and everything else in, in the competition. I, that, that was a great series. I can't wait to see more of it. Before I let you go today, would you leave us with some words of inspiration, wisdom uh, that might relate to your wonderful book? And then we'll talk about how people can get their hands on that and learn more about you. Yeah, I, I would say that if you could do one thing, it, it would be to just put this in front of you. And that is, we don't live to work. Okay, the human being, the human body doesn't travel 90 years on this planet in the obsession of, of working. What we do is we work so that we can live. And w what I want people to do is I want them to figure out what the hell live means. Like, what does that mean? What is it like to live, to live the way I, I want to do it, the way I see it for myself and my family? And, and so, yeah, if, if you can put the words, you know, we, we work so that we can live and really put those words, you know, live is the em emphasis there. I think you'll start to understand the difference because, man, it t too many people stare at Friday or too many people stare at paychecks or too many people stare at their bills at the end of the month. And um, you got to get you got to get beyond that. You got to get to the point where you say, I'm in control of this life and, and, uh, and I'm going to start taking it right now. Amen to that. Again, listeners, this book by Ken Rusk, Blue Collar Cash, 
love your work, secure your future, and find happiness for life. How can people learn more about you, Ken, and get their hands on a copy of your book? Well, we're doing something pretty cool. So I'm a believer that you shouldn't just read a book and put it up on the shelf and look at it like a trophy and then forget about it, you know, three months in. So I built this course. It's, it's a course that helps you to do the visualization that I've just been talking to you about. And um, it's an hour a week for eight weeks. You can take it at your leisure. You can do it in a weekend if you want. But so what I did was I built this thing to help folks because, you know, my life was really good before I wrote this book. I didn't do it to make money. But what, what I'm doing is I've seen courses out there for 1500 2000 three. No, that's not what this is about. My course is 99 bucks, and you get a free uh, $25 book with it. But if you sign up for that, I will donate a, a free book and a free course to anyone of your choice. Wow. And um, that's uh, we're, it's a great Christmas gift, actually, because you can give the gift of knowledge and give the gift of change to not only yourself, but to somebody else in the process. And um, we're excited about it. Um, uh, the, the, most of the money that I make on any of this stuff goes back to charities anyway. So we're hoping people take advantage of that. You can go to KenRusk.com and uh, it'll show you how to go to the path. Uh, it's called it's, it's the Blueprint to Success. It's, it's, um, and that's what the name of the course is, the path to success. And uh, we, uh, you can go there on, at, at KenRusk.com and, and see how to get involved. And um, I'll be happy to help you out from there. Yeah, that's awesome. And for you listeners, if you have a friend uh, out there who's trying to kind of figure out something and we are coming up on the New Year's where, you know, the proverbial New Year's resolution is coming up of rethinking about your life, what you want to do. Uh, this sounds like an awesome opportunity, a very, very affordable. And I love the fact that you're carrying it forward by uh, also including a gift to someone else. And you get the book, too. So I'll put a link to Ken Rusk or it's easy to find KenRusk.com. I'll put links to how you can get your hands on this book. And I always tell people, Books are incredible gifts for the holiday season because they give more than just the object. And then that person can give that book forward to the next person and they can just keep on giving. I also want to do a shout out today to Nicholas Hutchinson uh, from Book Thinkers, a great guy that I've just gotten to know. He introduced me to Ken. So, Nick, thank you so much. Ken, thanks for being so generous today with your time, your expertise. What an awesome thing you're doing. Until you and I talk again, I'll see you down the road. Take care. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah.